Filicide, the deliberate act of a parent or parents killing their child, is undoubtedly one of mankind's most heinous crimes. In our hypermedia age, this crime elicits massive media interest and, unfortunately, interference. In today's video, we take you to India and look at a 2008 murder that became a media feeding frenzy, fraught with inept police procedures, and to this day is no closer to being solved than it was 15 years ago. On May 16, 2008, when 13-year-old Arusha Talwa was discovered deceased with her throat slashed in her room in Noida, India, authorities promptly questioned her parents. Due to the rarity of taking one's life by slitting the throat, the police were confident they were dealing with a homicide. However, the subsequent investigation proved to be anything but straightforward. In fact, the mystery took so many unexpected turns that it became an almost unprecedented who done it and why. Initially, the prime suspect was 45-year-old Hemraj Banjadi, a butler of sorts at the residence of the Talwas, until his decomposing body was discovered a day after Arushi. With two homicides on their hands, the authorities began to botch the investigation, including not securing the crime scene after the death of Arushi and allowing the media and curious public to enter the home hours after the murder. Nonetheless, the investigation quickly zeroed in on the individuals with the access and potential motive for the two murders. Arushi's parents. Arushi was born on May 24, 1994, to two dentists, attended Delhi Public School, and lived with her parents in Noida Sector 25. Doctors Rajesh and Napur Talwa practiced at a clinic in Sector 27 and at Fortis Hospital, where Rajesh headed the dental division. Around 6 a.m. on May 16, 2008, the family's housekeeper Bharati Mandal, who had only been working for the Talwas for six days, rang the doorbell. Banjade would typically open the door for her daily, as Nippur and Rajesh were both late risers. But on this morning, even after she rang the doorbell twice, nobody answered. She later revealed that she tried to unlock the exterior gate, but was unsuccessful. Nippur opened the innermost wooden door following Bharati's third doorbell ring. She told Bharati through the lattice of the middle grill door that this door was locked from the outside. She questioned Bharati about Banjade's whereabouts. Nupur remarked that Banjade must have gone outside to get milk and locked the door from the outside. Nupur asked Bharati to wait outside till Banjade got back. Bharati did not want to wait, so she asked that Nupur toss the keys. Nupur instructed her to go down the stairs so she could throw the keys to her from the balcony. When the housekeeper entered the residence, she noticed Rajesh was awake. Both parents were found sobbing in their daughter's bedroom. Look at what Hemraj has done, they shouted. Bharati spotted Arushi lying motionless in a pool of blood, with her throat slashed. She immediately summoned neighbors and called medical assistance. By the time the authorities arrived at 7.15 a.m., 15 of the Talwa's invited guests were already in the living room, while another five or six were in the Talwa's master bedroom. Dozens of people tampering with the integrity of DNA evidence and rearranging objects at the crime scene was later seen as reprehensible by authorities and the public. Most of the 28 fingerprint samples collected by police from the crime site were smeared and ineffective as usable evidence. Rajesh oddly instructed the police not to unlock the closed terrace door and offered them $365 to locate Banjadi. The narrative that the live-in attendant committed the crime spread almost immediately. Later, the Central Bureau of Investigation, or CBI, mentioned how aggressively the Talwas promoted this story. Rajesh and Nupur asserted they did not hear a single sound during the homicides. According to them, their closed door and air conditioner muffled the noises made during the homicides. Investigators started to piece together what could have happened the night of Arushi's murder. The night that Arushi was murdered, her friend Anmol called the Talwa's landline at around midnight as he could not reach her on her mobile phone. 
Typically, Arushi stayed up past midnight chatting with her friends and using her phone. However, after 9.10 p.m. on May 15th, her phone was turned off and she was not answering any calls. Ann Moles then sent her a text message at 12.30 a.m. Her phone never received the message because it had been turned off. The phone was later discovered on a rural road near the Noida neighborhood of Sadarpur. The memory had been completely erased. According to the CBI closure report, the Talwars returned home from work at 9.30 p.m. on the night of their daughter's death. They reportedly shared a meal with her and gave her a new digital camera for her birthday. After taking a few family photos, the family retired at 11 p.m. According to her parents, Arushi always closed and locked her bedroom door before going to sleep. The keys were typically left on Nupur's nightstand, but the mother told police she could not recall whether she locked the door that night. After they retired for the night, Rajesh used the internet to catch up on his emails. He sent his final email at 11.57 p.m. after receiving a landline phone call. According to his testimony, he went to bed, although his last internet use was recorded just after midnight. It is believed that both Arushi and Banjadi were murdered between midnight and 1 a.m. It was discovered that Arushi's internet router was turned off at 3.43 a.m., indicating that whoever entered the room to turn it off either did not notice the blood-stained bed and dead girl or was culpable for her death. Nupur discovered the apartment and terrace keys on Banjadi's bed the next day. Arushi's bedroom keys were located in the living room. Although the property's gate was locked from the outside, there were no other house keys. Did somebody else have an extra set? On the morning of May 16th, visitors to the Talwar's home observed bloodstains on the door handle of the terrace. Rajesh's former colleagues, who were checking in on the couple, later reported to the police that they saw bloodstains on the terrace door, its latch, and the stairs leading to the terrace. When a police officer asked Rajesh for the terrace key, he went into the house and did not come out for a long time. Rajesh later said that he had no recollection of what happened at the time, but he insisted that he never prevented investigators from entering any part of the residence. The authorities could not access the door and left it closed until the following day. On the morning of May 17th, police broke the lock. Upon entering the terrace, they noticed red drag marks. At approximately 10.30 a.m., a corpse in advanced stages of putrefaction was discovered, lying in a pool of blood. Banjadi's body had been found with injuries consistent with that of Arushi's. There was evidence that both corpses had been repositioned within the apartment. The new explanation was that Banjadi had been dragged to the terrace while wrapped in a bedsheet. The terrace door was then closed, after which the murderer or murderers re-entered the residence and drank whiskey. Both victims' blood was discovered on a bottle of whiskey found on the kitchen table. However, the authorities had neglected to secure adequate samples from it. Additionally, the crime scene appeared to have been cleaned of any evidence that would implicate the Talwas. The Talwas instructed their servants to use detergent and water to sanitize the floor and walls of Arushi's room. Her bloodied mattress was also thrown onto a neighbor's terrace. During the time that the autopsy report was being written, Rajesh's older brother Dinesh, his family friend Sushil Chowdhury, the retired deputy superintendent of police and someone at an unidentified number began communicating, according to phone records. Later, the CBI stated that these communications may have been an attempt by the family to use their relationship with the police to remove references to rape from the autopsy report. According to the theory, Rajesh killed his daughter and Benjadi in a fit of rage after catching her engaging in sexual activity with Benjadi, which may or may not have been consensual. He wanted all references to sexual activity removed from the report. As soon as Benjadi's body was discovered, the Talwas became primary suspects. They knew where the liquor cabinet was, had keys to the residence and were present when the homicides occurred. 
The police promptly arrested Rajesh on May 23rd. An expert who examined the crime scene concluded that the murderer was very close to Arushi. There was evidence that she had intercourse and had been penetrated and then cleaned by someone as no semen was discovered. The police suspected that Rajesh Talwar discovered his live-in domestic and young daughter were engaging in sexual activity and that he executed his daughter as an honor-slaying and Benjadi for raping her. A second theory suggested that Rajesh himself had extramarital affairs and was confronted by his daughter and blackmailed by Banjadi. The Talwa family took these accusations very seriously. They claimed that the police were attempting to frame them as murderers to conceal how poorly they had managed the investigation before turning it over to the CBI. Initially, the CBI exonerated the two parents. Their new suspects were Krishna Thadarai, the Talwa's assistant, and Raj Kumar and Vijay Mandal, two servants. It was clear to the CBI that this was an inside job. As there were no traces of forced entry and the property's gate was secured from the outside, whoever murdered Arushi and Banjadi had access to the residence. The CBI's interrogation of the three new suspects led them to believe that Arushi was murdered following a thwarted sexual assault and that Banjadi fell victim to the perpetrators. However, due to the dubious interrogation methods conducted, all three were released when no concrete evidence was discovered. What perplexed everyone, however, was why the murderer would leave Banjadi to decompose on the terrace, especially if they lived there. The CBI hypothesized that the body was concealed there so that it could be disposed of once the investigation of Arushi's crime scene was complete. With so much media attention and many people entering the residence, this was no longer possible. The CBI also began to suspect that Arushi's parents were involved, despite insufficient evidence because the crime scene had been so extraordinarily contaminated by dozens of people. However, in 2010, the CBI turned over its investigation to another team who suggested closing the case. Despite this, Rajesh was identified as the sole credible suspect, even though he was not charged due to the lack of evidence. The Talwa family unsuccessfully contested this accusation. In 2011, the CBI reopened the investigation and identified Rajesh and Nupur as the prime suspects. In February 2011, when the CBI altered the status of the closure report to a charge sheet, the Talwas petitioned the Allahabad High Court and the Supreme Court, but were denied. They were now being tried for the murder of their daughter. The trial began on May 11, 2013, and concluded on November 25, 2013, with guilty verdicts for both defendants. According to media reports, the prosecution offered the following explanation for Arushi Talwa's murder. On the night of the murders, Rajesh heard a noise and assumed it had come from Banjadi's room. He didn't find anyone in there and picked up the golf club from Banjadi's room before entering Arushi's. There he saw the pair engaged in sexual activity. Rajesh clubbed the 45-year-old servant over the head. When he tried to hit him again, Banjadi moved, leading the father to accidentally strike his own daughter instead. By the time Nupur was awakened by the noise and rushed into the room, both Banjadi and Arushi were near death. The injured Hamraj had fallen from the bed, said Special Prosecutor A.G.L. Cowell. Both checked Arushi's pulse and found her near dead, which scared them, and they decided to kill Banjadi so no one discovered the incident. The married couple realized they'd have to fabricate a scenario in order to get away with the double murder of their daughter, Arushi Talwa, and their servant. They wrapped Banjadi's body up and took him to the terrace to get rid of his corpse another time. They slit his throat and decided to do the same to their daughter. They also cleaned her vagina. Rajesh and Nupur then cleaned the crime scene, bloodstains on the floor and stained clothing and whatever they could see was tainted by the violent act, were mopped up and disposed of. The couple then left the house, locked the gates from the outside, and entered the residence from Banjadi's room to fool the authorities. 
Prosecutor A.G.L. Cowell would conclude. After years of trials and legal proceedings, Rajesh and Nupur Talwa were given life sentences in November 2013. The decision was heavily criticized for being based on insufficient and circumstantial evidence, and the Talwas again appealed to the Allahabad High Court. In 2017, the Allahabad High Court reversed the CBI's court ruling for the absence of direct evidence. Judges stated that there were no eyewitnesses. They believed that the CBI had also failed to provide a convincing motive. It took four years, but the parents were acquitted on October 12, 2017, and they have been free ever since. The case is still unresolved, and the family blames the CBI, local police, and the media for sabotaging an investigation that should have led to their daughter's killer being found. What most likely happened in the Arushi Talwa and Hemraj Banjadi murder cases? An honor killing is the homicide of a family member by other family members due to the belief that the victim has brought shame or dishonor upon the family or has violated the principles of a community or religion, typically for reasons such as refusing to enter an arranged marriage, being in a relationship that is disapproved by their family, having sex outside of marriage, becoming the victim of rape, dressing in a manner which is deemed inappropriate, or engaging in homosexual relations. Noida, where the Talwas lived, is in the province of Uttar Pradesh in India. According to a survey, over 30% of honor killings in the country occur in Uttar Pradesh. Arushi Talwar and Hemraj Banjadi's murders have all the makings of an honor killing by the Talwas. Whether the two were discovered having consensual sex or Banjadi was caught violating the teenage girl, the punishment in an honor killing would have been the same. The conclusion by prosecutors, barring the dramatic tone of their narrative of the night's events, is most likely what caused the Talwas to kill their daughter and servant. Due to the parents' strange behavior, the Talwas pushing the narrative that Banjadi had killed their daughter, Arushi's body being washed after death, and no sign of a break-in, all point to an inside job by the parents. The Talwar case captivated the media almost immediately and remained so until the Talwar's acquittal in 2017. As with the allegations about Arushi's father's extramarital affair, the rumors of a sexual relationship between a teenage girl and her male servant provided fodder for yellow journalism, which is journalism that presents little or no legitimate, well-researched news and instead uses attention-grabbing headlines to increase sales. Critics argued that the tabloid journalism of an overzealous media and the police's errors had prejudiced the administration of justice. On July 22, 2008, a Supreme Court bench cautioned the media to be cautious in its coverage of the case and to refrain from making unfounded allegations about Arushi or her father's character. It criticized the lack of sensitivity, taste, and decorum in the sensationalist media coverage. The media dismissed the caution and carried on regardless. Did Krishna Thadarai, Rajkumar, and Mandal kill Arushi and Banjadi in a botched sexual assault, or did the parents execute her as an honor killing? We would love to hear your opinion on this little-known case, so please comment below. If you love our content and want to support the channel, feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.